live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. When you think of Super Bowl 35, there are probably a few things that come to mind. You might think of Kerry Collins getting completely destroyed by Baltimore's incredible defense, throwing no touchdowns, four picks, and posting a 7.1 passer rating. You might think of Trent Dilfer somehow being a starting quarterback on a Super Bowl winning team. But if there's one particular moment that you think of, it's probably Jermaine Lewis's iconic kickoff return. With the Ravens up 17 to seven, and the Giants somehow getting back into it following Ron Dixon's kickoff return for a touchdown, Lewis answered right back and returned it 84 yards to the house. That return was the dagger. There was no way back for the Giants after that. But that play almost never happened. One roster decision by the Giants made that play entirely possible. And this is the story behind Jim Fassel's controversial roster move that changed everything. First, we need some context with regards to how the Giants got to this point. In the latter half of the 1990s, the Giants kicker was Brad Daloiso. All things considered, Daloiso was a pretty solid kicker. He had a pretty strong leg early on in his career. In 1992, as a member of the Denver Broncos, he had a touchback on 80% of his kicks. When Dan Reeves got fired from the Broncos after the 1992 season and became the coach of the Giants, Daloiso followed him over and had an impressive 1994 campaign, where he hit all 11 of his field goal attempts. He began his career as a kickoff specialist, but by 1995, he was the Giants' primary kicker, and by 1996, he was one of the best kickers in all of football. He was named the NFC Special Teams Player of the Week twice that season, and hit on over 88% of his field goals, which ranked second in the league, only behind Kerry Blanchard of the Indianapolis Colts. D'Aloiso's eight years with the Giants were largely good, but by 2000, there was one thing missing from D'Aloiso's game, and that was any leg strength whatsoever. During the 2000 season, the Giants didn't even have him attempt any kicks from 50 plus yards, and from 30 plus yards, he was just 9 for 15, hitting on just 60% of his tries. And perhaps the best stat to show his loss of leg strength was in touchbacks. He kicked the ball off 56 times during that season, and recorded a touchback on just two of those kicks. Returners knew that if Daloiso was kicking off, they were more than likely going to have the green light to go. Daloiso's average kickoff distance was a mere 59.6 yards. Remember that back in 2000, kickoffs were taking place at the 30 yard line. So this meant that on average, returners were fielding the ball ahead of the 10 yard line. The Giants were allowing an average of 22.5 yards per return, which on its own isn't very good. But do the math, and this meant that if Daloiso was kicking off, the opposing team was getting the ball on average somewhere near the 30 or the 35 yard line. Something else happened during that season though. Daloiso got hurt, and the Giants needed someone to fill in. Enter Jarrett Holmes. While Daloiso was hurt, the Giants signed Jarrett Holmes to fill in for a few games during the middle of the season. The Giants knew what Holmes could do as he was on the team's practice squad for parts of that 1999 season before finishing the year with the Chicago Bears, where he went 2-for-2 two two in his limited opportunities. When D'Aloiso suffered from a stiff back, the Giants brought Holmes back. He knew that this was just a temporary thing, since that's the life of a kicker on the bubble. He didn't even have his own locker at the time, as he was living out of the locker of injured cornerback Ralph Brown. But he did his job. More importantly, he had a leg. His kickoffs traveled an average of 66.8 yards. He had two touchbacks and six tries, which is obviously a significantly higher percentage than D'Aloiso, who finished the season with a touchback on just 3.6% of his kicks. Against the Titans, Holmes gave Derek Mason, the best return man in football from a yardage standpoint, just one opportunity to field a kick. And the Giants liked what they saw in Holmes so much that they decided to keep him on the roster. Even when D'Aloiso came back and got his job back, Holmes was still there, even though he was inactive most of the time. The Giants then shocked the football world. The team was not expected to be anything better than mediocre, but somehow went 12-4 and, and made it all the way to Super Bowl 35. If you know the Ravens, you know how explosive and dynamic of a return man Jermaine Lewis is. During that 2000 season, he led the league with two punt return touchdowns, 
and with 16.1 yards per punt return. He also had two punt return touchdowns in 1997 and in 1998. It's not much of an exaggeration to say that Lewis was one of the best return men of all time. As Lewis said before the game, I'm thinking about taking it to the end zone every minute I'm on the sideline. If I have just a little bit of room, I'm going to take a shot. And many thought that Fassel was going to counter Lewis's explosive return abilities by activating Jarrett Holmes and by using him as the kickoff specialist. That did not happen. It seemed like such an obvious move. Don't kick the ball to Lewis, and especially don't kick it short. Activate a kicker with a leg and take Lewis out of the equation on special teams. So why didn't this happen? Well, Tiggy Barber had a broken left arm. During a game against the Dallas Cowboys on December 17th, Barber broke his arm, but decided to keep playing, saying, it's football. We play with injuries. We play when we're sick. I have two arms. I can carry the ball in my right arm. I'm not too worried. Speaking of which, if you want to see an instance of a player playing in the Super Bowl while legitimately being sick to the point where he was on a hospital bed 24 hours before the game, then click the card in the upper right corner. Barber played and did not miss any time. But there were obvious concerns from Fassel that it could get worse at any minute. If Barber got hurt, then the Giants would be incredibly thin at the position had they deactivated someone. They would have Ron Dane, their first round pick from the draft that year, and that's about it. Excluding quarterbacks, the next closest player in carries was Greg Camella, their fullback who had 10 carries that year. Their third leading rusher was Amani Toomer, a wide receiver. The Giants had no one behind Barber and Dane as it was, and if Barber somehow made his arm worse during the game, the team would be completely screwed on the ground. Because of this, Fassel decided to keep all of the running backs active and did not activate Holmes for the Super Bowl. Plus, Fassel was hopeful that Deloiso, now that he had some time to rest after the two-week break, would find some rejuvenated strength in his legs, even though it hadn't been there all season, and even though he had a touchback on just 3.6% of his kicks. As we now know, that was a mistake. Jermaine Lewis had one of the most iconic kickoff return touchdowns in Super Bowl history, and the Ravens won their first Super Bowl in franchise history because of it. Would the Giants have won this game if Holmes was activated? Let's make this perfectly clear, absolutely not. The Ravens put together one of the most dominant defensive performances in Super Bowl history, and Kerry Collins and company were not doing anything on that day. But might the game not have gotten out of hand before the fourth quarter? I think so. This game taught the league an important lesson if they didn't know it already. Special teams is something that should not be overlooked, especially in the Super Bowl. Be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Tuesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL Trivia and win cash prizes, link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JRGator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.